Namo Myo Renge Kyo. Hello, everyone. I hope this finds you well and secure. Um, I'm tossing how I should proceed. I have uh, right now three books. Two of which I, well, one is an assemblage I made. It's available on lulu.com. Uh, the profound meaning of the Daimoku. And basically, they are cherry picked um, uh, writings of Nichiren on Namo uh, Myo Rengekyo, uh, the Daimoku of the Lotus Sutra, the, the, the nature of the mandala of Gohonzon assembled into one book. And I thought it might be interesting to do a series just on, and this is by no means all of the references Nietzsche made in his uh, Go Show. You know, we have uh, over something like 550 uh, videos dedicated to Nietzsche's writings. And uh, these are just cherry picked as directly relating to the Daimoku. And I thought that might be a really good exercise. Then I have this book that was sent to me by one of you. And that, that I hadn't seen before. I don't even know. Well, this says 1994. So it may still be in print. There's a nice BN. And if some of you are interested in it, it's a talk on Nietzsche and Shonin's um, Object of Worship. I don't like the rhetoric, as you know, but basically talking about the mandala of Gohonzon by uh, Tetsujo Kuboda and translated by um, Hamilton Lamont. And uh, Sankibo Buddhist Bookstore Limited, Hongo, Tokyo, Japan. So, uh, but I found it interesting. It, it, it has mirrored pages of English versus uh, Japanese, I believe. Yeah, it would have to be Japanese uh, kanji. But uh, yeah, it talks about namo myoren geikyo, the essential phrase. A lot of the same kind of material, but from a different point of view. And I thought, well, that might be really interesting to... Uh, to investigate, to read, and to see what uh, perspectives and information we might gain. I mean, it starts off with, and, and one thing that encourages me about it, is a, a picture of the mandala, which this is a later mandala of Nichiren's, and you'll see how uh, incredibly familiar it is to our TLK uh, Buddhist mandala uh, because that is you know a Nichiren inscribed mandala it's not some other you know government or um, organizational hierarchy claim it's it's the actual it says this mandala note it's called the mandala the uh, the tool of uh, focus was inscribed by Nichiren Shonen at age 59 in the 11th month of the third year of the Koan era, 1280. So, in the latter part of his life. This, uh, this mandala shows the world of the eternal Buddha as reflected in the mind and eyes of Nichiren Shonen. It is uh, the image of all Buddhas, Bodhisattvas and other beings, having been emancipated, it says saved, by the title, Namo Myoho Rengekyo. So, uh, you know, there is some Western rhetoric in here. There's some other images of the, the breakdown. Uh, let's see if I, there we go. Of, uh, of these, uh, of the uh, mandala. There's some excellent pictures in here of artwork um, depicting. There's one with Nitrin in the middle and Taho and uh, Shakyamuni on either side of him with the, uh, the, uh, the Daimoku down the center, Namo Myo Rengekyo. Anyway, very interesting book, and uh, we could go page by page and um, investigate this book. I think that would be a, a fun project. 
And then I have this little tome that I, I called, I don't even remember from when. This is an older one, and I, I failed. I don't even know. It looks like there's an ISBN on here, but I don't, I don't think I assigned it one. So you may not be able to get it on the, on the bookstore. I'll have to check. I don't see an ISBN, and I don't see the credit for where I culled all of this information. But it's interesting in that it's, I, I called it The Life of Nitrin, and uh, it has basically a historical background of Japan at the time, and then it has, uh, you know, the basic outline of, my goodness, pinch turning karma. Uh, so it sets up the scene in Japan, medieval Japan, then the life of uh, Nitrin, who we, we just got done reading a whole biography. So this is very shortened. Um, that's the second chapter. And then the last chapter, I believe, is uh, Nitrin's Doctrine of Buddhism. Uh, so it's a very condensed, concise, kind of a uh, something I put together a long time ago. Uh, just as a... Uh, oh, and there's another chapter the writings of Nietzsche and Shonen. Um, it talks about the Zenshu. I probably didn't have, yeah, Jose Toda and all that. Um, yeah, this is really old. Anyway, it uh, it's kind of a contextual reference. So I don't know how important that one is, given everything else we're reading. But uh, of the one we just finished on Nietzsche's Lifetime and these two, The Profound Meanings of the Daimoku and this other book, um, I think they would make fascinating discussion. I don't know which to do first of these two books. The one focused on the mandala and the one focused on the daimoku. They overlap a lot, obviously. Maybe we'll start with the profound meanings of the daimoku. We've already read these, uh, Gosho, of course. But I don't, I guess they repair, uh, they repair, they bear repeating. And always, you know, when years go by, our practice evolves, our understanding deepens. And I include myself, obviously. Um, my reading of these writings will have different points to make, different insights to share. So I don't. It may seem on the surface to be repetitive, but I, I don't think there's any danger of that. So we'll start with the one essential phrase. For you to inquire about the Lotus Sutra and ask its meaning is a rare source of good fortune. In this age of the latter day of the law, those who ask about the meaning of the even one phrase or verse of the Lotus Sutra are far fewer than those who can hurl Mount Sumeru to another land like a stone, or those who can kick the major world system away like a ball. Obvious hyperbole, right? This is a consistent theme. But it points to how <sighs> language is a tool of communication. Yeah? I don't think anyone would argue. However, to express deeply profound, innate, or visceral concepts of experience, language is, it's, it's wishy-washy. It doesn't identify things specifically other than by a, prof uh, a, a profusion of words to circumlocute an idea. And even after all the words, unless you experience fully what is being discussed, that experience for yourself in your own embodied way, How do you transfer that sensation, that experience, that how, 
how do you transfer or, or imbue another person's mind with that experience? The answer, it's futile. All you can do is encourage another mind to explore and to instantiate for itself that same experience. And that's the job of the Bodhisattva. That's our mission in our practice. To, invo to embody so deeply, so well, the idea of enlightenment and our experience of Buddhaness, life at its core formations, moment to moment, experience it fully. Only then can we imbue whatever words we use, whatever efforts or gestures we make to others who are seeking the confidence, the resolve to do for themselves as we are doing. That's the essence of the practice, yeah? So yeah, can you lift up Mount Everest one hand or two hands? Of course not. But the idea being that to really commit to this en mission of enlightenment, which is not only for self, because the true mission of enlightenment is to radiate what is being discovered, experienced, embodied into the world. It takes a, a different level, a deep level of commitment. And that commitment requires confidence. How can you commit to something fully if you don't have confidence in achieving it? Or confidence in attempting it? Right? How many of us, and it's not just Buddhism, how many of us are, are, are just completely flummoxed or, or stop before we even try something because we don't have the confidence that we could actually not just do it, but to excel at it. Ooh, that's another, that's quite a, a uh, what's the wording usually? A, uh, an order of magnitude. More commitment, yeah? So right off the bat, he continues, they are even fewer than those who can embrace the teaching or and teach countless other sutras, thereby enabling the monks and lay believers who listen to them to obtain the six transcendental powers. Equally rare is a monk who can explain the meaning of the Lotus Sutra and resolve people's doubts concerning it. Not rare because it's hard to find, Rare because it's hard to do. The treasure tower. Namo Myo Rengekyo. We've talked about the treasure tower a lot, haven't we? The treasure tower chapter in the fourth volume of the Lotus Sutra sets forth the important principle of the six difficult and nine easy acts. You, asking a question about the Lotus Sutra, is among the six difficult acts. This is a sure indication that if you embrace the Lotus Sutra, you will become a Buddha in your present form. This is the first chapter of the one essential phrase, and it really encompasses the entirety of Shakyamuni's teachings. I say that not to impress you, or, uh, but... As we are all developing our bodhisattva mission, it's important to remember that paragraphs like this can be very useful in discussion with others. When somebody is seeing, what, what is this Lotus Sutra? What do you do? Oh, I remember something Nichiren wrote. Let's chant for five minutes 
and then I'll read this one cha this one chapter to you or, or a paragraph to you and we can talk about it. There you go. Easy as that. The, uh, the writing continues. Since the Lotus Sutra defines our body as the Dharma body of Buddhaness, of the thus come one. Our mind as the reward body of the thus come one. And our actions as the manifested body of a thus come one. All who uphold and believe in the even a single phrase or verse of this sutra will be endowed with the benefits of these three bodies. We've talked about the three bodies a lot, right? Namu myo ho renge kyo is only one phrase or verse, but it is no ordinary phrase. For it is the essence of the entire sutra. Remember all the discussions we've had about all these nomenclatures and rhetoric in Buddhism being embodiments or personages of mental workings, not just mental types, but actual mental workings, how your mind and my mind, though we can achieve the same thing, come about it through our own native experience and therefore differ. You ask whether one can attain Buddhahood only by chanting Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. And this is the most important question of all. This is the heart of the entire sutra and the substance of its eight volumes. Notice it's Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. Hmm? The spirit within one's body of five or six feet may appear in just one's face, which is only a foot long. And the spirit within one's face may appear in just one's eyes, which are only an inch across. Included with the, within the two chapter, uh, characters representing Japan is all that is within the country's 66 provinces. Right? We are like that. I, you talk to a photographer. They'll tell you the most important thing to get in focus is the eyes. We have all kinds of poetry about seeing one's essential being through the eyes. When we say the word Japan or Canada or Australia or Earth or universe or galaxy or solar system don't we immediately raise that catalog of information we have associated with that word right i've talked about the warehouse the database of identification we hold in our minds all the time the people and the animals the rice paddies and the other fields those of high and low status the nobles and the commoners the seven kinds of treasures and the other precious gems similarly included within the title or daimoku of namu myoho renge kyo is the entire sutra consisting of all eight volumes 28 chapters and 69384 characters without the omission of a single character Concerning this, Po Chuil stated that the title is to the sutra as the eyes are to the Buddha. In the eight volumes of his annotations on, quote, the words and phrases of the Lotus Sutra, in quote, Miao Lo states, quote, when for the sake of brevity one mentions only the Daimoku or title, the entire sutra is by implication included therein. By this he means that although for the sake of brevity one only the title of the sutra is spoken, the entire sutra is contained in the title alone. Why is that important? What does that essentially mean? I, I want to talk about this for a minute because it is absolutely, I believe, 
it's, it's certainly the reason I um, have read so many other sutras in videos with you emulating exactly what Nietzschean did because I've had some comments of people, why don't you just talk about Nietzschean? Well, I am. But Nietzschean, if you review the Go Show, spoke about Chinese folklore. He spoke about old sutras. He spoke about Nagarjuna. He quoted, as he just did, Miao Lo, Tin Dai, Dengyo. Of course, Shakyamuni. All of his teachings. Why? Is the simple visual enough to portray this? We use the visual of triangles everywhere. Kandinsky wrote a book called The Spiritual in Art, concerning the spiritual in art. Little book. I remember decades ago when I read it, I found it fascinating. He spoke about a spiritual triangle, speaking about how society never stays static. It's always moving. The vertex of the triangle always moving through time. Very Buddhist, right? Life is a moment-to-moment, -moment, constant momentum through time-space. Kandinsky visualized this with a triangle, indicating that if you segmented the triangle, the quantity of those at the very peak that were challenging perception was a small amount compared to the relative layers below larger and larger amounts of people aspiring, at least some of them, to climb up that spiritual ladder. I really related to that. It really, to me, so resonated with Buddhism. And here it is in a different form, at least in my visualization, that you have the Daimoku, Namo Myo Renge Kyo, the title of the Lotus Sutra, at the very pinnacle of that constantly moving pyramid. But that peak of the pyramid exists, is called a peak because it references the entire pyramid. And just as Nietzsche did throughout his life, he dipped into different levels of the triangle to endeavor to step people up the ladder toward that ultimate teaching. But when you invoke that ultimate invocation, it isn't all alone. It isn't in itself magical or mystical. It is a representation of it is an invocation of the entire triangle. And so the more we study different parts of that triangle, the more our invocation is met by volumes of profundity, of understanding, of inclusion. So when you sit in front of your Butsudan and you focus on your mandala and you chant Namu Myo Renge Kyo, you are not simply chanting those characters. You are standing on the conception, the, the entirety concept, a conceptual profundity and teachings and... and um, stories, analogs, analogies, personages, depths of understanding and experience that are held within that title. Those sounds of Namu Myoho Renge Kyo carry with it the entirety of the life of the universe as described in so many words and ways and stories to conceptualize the entire experience of all
It's huge. It's something impossible to hold in your mind constantly and certainly to recite. But the more we know about that volume of understanding in life, when each time we invoke it through the title, Namo Myoho Kyo, that is the profundity of the Daimoku. That is the single simple, <laughs> deceptively so, invocation that instantly transports all of your consciousnesses to buddha -ness. That you can carry with you into your samsaric day. Hmm? I'm going to drop it off there. The next uh, paragraph is a long one. Starts with everything has its essential point. Certainly. When you say I'm hungry and I want to eat, you haven't identified what meal you're going to make, but you have identified an entire possibility, a rel very many realms of what you're committing yourself to. Same thing. Make sense? I'm going to drop you off with that today. Still recovering. I'm tired. I appreciate your participation. I appreciate your practice most of all. And your support for our Sangha. Like, subscribe. Patrons, you guys. Amazing. Let me know what you think. The Profound Meaning of the Daimoku or this other book on the uh, mandala. I think we'll cover them both. I'll do them both. I just started with the Daimoku. An important reminder. We'll stick with Nichiren as our subject for a while. Thank you for joining me. Let me know your thoughts. Oh, and if you have some other rare book or or something you've collected from your past that you think suits our sangha that is something you'd be curious to hear my understanding interpretation experience of um, either recommended to me or as this uh, this subscriber did send me this book what a wonderful gift I'm always willing to learn find things that are either no longer published or were once published or published through certain avenues. It's fascinating to see how much is in ingredients, even if the rhetoric goes awry, the, the essential points are still there. So with that, I will uh, let you get on with your day. Thank you once again. And I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye for now.